five years ago, um, my partner on the film, Robert Gordon, came across a bootleg tape and watched it. And I think we were instantly struck with how incredibly contemporary it was in one way, which is the issues they were talking about were exactly the issues of today that we're still dealing with, with foreign wars and race and gender inequality and on and on. Uh, at the same time, the way they were speaking and their personage uh, on television, having that much time to speak uninterrupted on national TV was completely foreign. It was, um, you know, somebody says, uh, you know, the past is a foreign world. You know, we don't recognize it. You know, it's, and uh, there was something about that that was completely transfixing. And we, we felt we wanted to make a movie uh, right away. You know, it took us five years to make this. This was five years ago when we started the process. And we didn't know if anybody else thought that there was a movie in this. But we intrinsically felt that there was this great story that said a lot of things we wanted to say. Uh, and part of that was Robert and I both started as journalists. We were big believers in the power of media to do good. And this just seemed like the ultimate kind of cautionary tale about, about media. And as a way of kind of testing the theory that this might become a film, we sent out some interview requests. And I think the first requests were to Christopher Hitchens, Frank Rich, James Wolcott, and Dick Cavett, all four of whom wrote back instantaneously saying, come, come now. And that was a good sign. And by the time we left that first interview, we knew we had a film. And then we just had to convince other people of it. You, you did a fifth, you had a fifth person you interviewed and ended up not using any of that. Gore himself. Yeah, we interviewed It wasn't Gore. good enough for your film. No. It's complicated. So I, as, as um, full disclosure, I actually used to work for Gore. Um, not that he would remember it, but I certainly remembered it. <laughs> that my first job out of college was working for a short time as a fact checker for Gore, which was certainly the worst job of my life. Because um, though Gore was brilliant and uh, had an incredible command of facts, and I uh, would quote passages from memory. It was my job to tell him he wasn't perfect. And uh, that was a very, a very thankless job. Um, but in terms of doing the interview, you know, we asked Gore to do an interview. And um, of course he said yes, because you don't turn down sex or appearing on television. And, um, but I don't think he really understood what we were going for. So, uh, and so we go up to his house. This is when he moved back to after, after his partner Howard had died. He moved back to Hollywood. He had a house in the Hollywood Hills. And it was a scene from Sunset Boulevard, a big Spanish mansion. And we set up in the living room, and he had this kind of manservant that brought him in in a wheelchair. This is about a year and a half before he, before he died. And, um, and Gore wasn't making eye contact with us. And by way of making polite conversation, uh, somebody in our crew said, my grandfather served in the Aleutian Islands when you did. And he said he couldn't get warm the entire time he was there. And Gore looked up at that moment for the first time and made eye contact with us, mm. almost burning eye contact, and said, I had my rage to keep me warm. And that was, <laughs> that was the beginning of a very, very long interview we did. Um, but why was it unusable? Well, I, Gore disagreed with the premise of our film. Uh, which is that he and Buckley sh uh, were in any way on an equal plane. You know, there was no comparing the I'm two. I'm sure Buckley agreed completely. Uh, exactly. That's one of the only thing. The only th other thing they ever agreed upon was they never wanted to see each other again. Um, but I think Gore. I mean, he accused us of being Buckleyites. It was a very difficult, strenuous interview. And at that point in his life, uh, he was in chronic pain. He wasn't in great shape. You know, we were talking about this just outside. Uh, so at the end of this long, long interview, um, his servant kind of wheels him away and takes him upstairs and comes back into the room and says, uh, Mr. Vidal would like to know if you'd like to have cocktails with him upstairs. And of course, we're both in need of cocktails and, and just wanted to, to see what... You couldn't turn down was, a story No, no, like no. That. I, we had to know what was going to happen. So we went upstairs and we thought we were going to be led into a den or a salon and instead, we were led into Gore's bedroom, at which point Gore was already back in bed. And Gore gestures, sit down, boys. And there are no chairs in the room. So <laughs> we all sat on Gore's bed and had cocktails and had a lovely 90-minute conversation with him where he was completely different. And all that being said, I don't think he ever would have given us a different interview hmm. than, the, what he did, than what he did. Um, that combined with the fact that Buckley had died in 2008, and it somehow felt unfair to have Gore 
speak and not Buckley. I mean, Gore already kind of had the last word, as it were, and it just didn't ever feel right to put that in. There is so much archival material out there on YouTube. You happened onto this debate and this footage. What made it contemporary enough for you? What was the click in your mind and in Robert's mind that you said, we can make a movie about this that people want to see because of what's happening today? Well, I mean, really more than, I mean, the issues were exciting, but the thing that really got me was just the drama of it. I mean, it was just incredible theater. And here were two guys that understood theater like very few people ever have, and particularly as public intellectuals ever have. I mean, Gore, I'm so tempted to know. sit here and knock my pencil. Like <laughs> exactly, should be leaning yes. much further back in your chair. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, Gore was a playwright and a um, screenwriter, and understood theater incredibly well, and how to deliver the perfect bone mole. And Buckley, I really think Buckley's first love was debate, not politics. Um, you know, many, many of his friends would say he didn't want to talk about politics when he wasn't on television, uh, that he wanted to talk about history or art. He kind of had a salon in his apartment in New York with his wife, Pat, who had a large circle of both gay and liberal friends. And most of Buckley's friends were liberals. I mean, he told one editor at the National Review who told me this, upon moving to New York, Buckley advised him, don't hang out with the conservatives. They're deadly boring. Hang out with the liberals. <laughs> I don't think Vidal would have done the opposite. <laughs> in, in watching it, I see the thread, the contemporary thread, with the idea of this incendiary discussion that isn't really debate. These men, at least in what we saw, weren't so much debating the issues as in provoking each other into flights of, of higher and higher rhetoric. Although, in, in a way, again, this being kind of at the birth of identity politics in 1968 and you know, Nixon's Southern strategy and the, the kind of commingling of the personal and the political. So in a way, uh, Gore being a homosexual or Buckley being a strict Vatican I Catholic were political stances. I think they thought that the personal attacks, in fact, were there to further their own political agenda. And the other thing where it, it, it diverges from modern day, and I was taking notes on it, it you heard subjunctives, you heard compound sentences, you heard balderdash and heuristic and Pericles. I'm not hearing that out of James Carville and Sarah Palin. No, no. In fact, um, in fact, I, you know, there's a anti-intellectualism in America, certainly. And I find... Go back to Stevenson and Eggheads yes, and Eisenhower. Exactly. But it's just gotten worse and worse. And television certainly plays a part in that. But now it's almost as though people pretend to be stupid. You know, I feel like, um, you know, George Bush went to Harvard and Yale, but pretends he's just a guy cutting brush. Uh, Obama kind of has this everyman accent I hear him use on the That's campaign trail. That's when he trail. drops the G at the end of the word. Yeah, it's like, why, you know, why are you pretending not to be the smart person you are? But that's kind of what you have to do to get over on television these days. And when you use a big word, when I occasionally see people use a word not like hobgoblinization, but, you know, something like that, that they would, um, they apologize for it. They apologize for it. I see people kind of say, well, I know nobody's going to get this, but, you know, nobody's going to remember this, but, but they're certainly not talking about Pericles. 